This evening to learn about application security. I only, I only promise 90 minutes. Okay, uh, if you need to leave early, no problem. I hope you all found pizza and beer. Um, my name is Sam Stepanian. This guy here is Sharif Mansour. We are your chapter leaders. Woo! Please come and talk to us. We run this event every two months. So for those who are here for the first time, uh, there will be another event soon. We also run hackathons and capture the flag competitions. This is coming soon as well. And uh, because the days are getting shorter and the nights are getting longer, we're going to run a hacker pub quiz competition. So there will be no death by PowerPoint. There will be just uh, fun questions and themes and prizes uh, from vendors. Okay, so somehow you all found us. If you don't know how to stay in touch with us, we have a mailing list. The best way, put your name there and you'll get an email the second we announce the event. We are also on Twitter. People on Twitter usually get notified again the second we put the tickets uh, <laughs> online. Uh, we also have a Facebook page on which we're streaming now live. We have a Slack page as well for those of you who are is a developer and like using Slack and a bit of interactive chatting there. Uh, our channel is called <laughs> Chapter London. If you need an invite for Slack, please do talk to us. We also have a YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com OS London. All the talks will be recorded and they will be available on YouTube later on. Okay, and of course we have a web page on OWASP.org. Um, those of you who are interested in the date of the next meeting is going to be 23rd of November. Details about that a bit later. So again, we are streaming live on Facebook, so those of you who couldn't make it, right? Uh, I know the tickets went very, very fast. You can watch from the comfort of your home, and you can watch the recording later on Facebook or on YouTube. This is the agenda for tonight. Okay, so you all had pizza, I think, by now. I'm going to do a short update about OWASP, for about conferences coming up, and uh, Sharif is going to say a few words as well. Uh, then we're going to have uh, Benji from Aqua talking about application level vulnerabilities in containerized applications. Containers are everywhere now, and people have no idea how to secure them, so hopefully we'll learn how to do it. We'll have a break, uh, during which we'll have a bit more pizza, beer, a bit of networking. Uh, and then uh, Suleiman is going to talk to us uh, about uh, bug bounty hunting and how he found lots of very interesting and juicy bugs and some big brand names. Uh, then we're going to have a quick wrap up which basically will tell us where to go and the place to go afterwards is the bar called Greenwood, it's the new shiny place which doesn't look like a pub, more looks like a skyscraper. But there's a bar upstairs which is big enough for all of us. So we're going to continue uh, drinking beer and networking there till closing time. Okay. Very quickly, who is OWASP? We're a global charity, we're a non-profit organization. Um, of course, we are focused, our mission is to improve application security. We are vendor neutral, we are supported by vendors, but uh, we don't endorse any particular vendor or their solution. Uh, we have a collective wisdom of the best minds <coughs> in application security worldwide. We're global, we have the best experts who help us provide 
free tools, free guidance, free standards for everyone to use. And our meetings are also free to everyone to attend. No one had to pay a single pay penny, and free beer is included. Um, there are 200 OWASP chapters worldwide. We're not alone. And London, uh, sorry, in the UK, there are quite a few chapters as well. If you're coming from up north, there's a good chapter in Leeds. Uh, Manchester, Cambridge, there's a chapter in Bristol. Bristol chapter is having an event right now with us. So I'm going to say hi to people in Bristol who are watching us because they have their own event there. Uh, there's a chapter in Scotland and Sheffield um, and Newcastle. Okay, we are all volunteers. There are 45,000 people uh, volunteering for OWASP. There is a membership. Okay, so it's individual and corporate membership, and it is only 50 US dollars per year. If you are not a member, I encourage you to become a member. First of all, you'll get the school sticker for your laptop. I know a lot of people like the stickers. If you are a member, come see me, I'll give you a sticker if you've got one. Okay, so if you are a member, you also get a lot of other benefits. Uh, the most important one is discounts for various cybersecurity conferences, and discounts range from 20% to 100%. And uh, most important, benefit of being an OWASP member, you get to vote on issues that shape OWASP. And more on that later, because we actually have an election coming up. So, um, these are all the uh, vendors which support us. As you can see, there are quite a lot of them. Um, some of them probably work, some of you work for these companies, I know. Uh, these big uh, companies give us 20,000 US dollars a year, so many thanks to them. Um, these companies on these slides are the ones who are kindly hosting our events and as you can see there's a journalist partnership with that and um, we have Steve Wright from journalist partnership who's going to say a couple of words and welcome us here. Uh, <laughs> uh, just a couple of words, just a big thank you uh, tonight for uh, Sam and OWASP. We absolutely support the whole ethos and what we're doing here um, with this, this entire um, program. Uh, many of our engineers, many of our application developers, etc., rely on this as a good source and um, that's fundamental. So we fundamentally want to support OWASP and all I wanted to say to you was um, big thanks to Sam, big thanks to Ray Han who looks after John Lewis but a little bit about us. Um, for those of you who don't know John Lewis and Waitrose, which is a surprise if you're here in the UK, um, but if you're not, um, if you're just visiting, um, we're a sort of retail organization predominantly. We're made up of about 400 branches. Generally speaking, our turnover is about 12 billion. And I have to say that most of our engineers, most of our security guys, we're numbering about 50, 60 um, across the entire business. Our, our whole uh, ethos is about protecting the brand, protecting the reputation of John Lewis and Waitrose, which is absolutely critical. Uh, this organization actually has been around for about 100 years, so it's a fantastic, um, very old, traditional British organization. But we are struggling because we are in a different environment, we're in a different demands, our cons consumers, uh, everything about how we interact with our customers is changing. And that means we, as engineers, as security guys and uh, girls, have to adapt and adopt these new ways of working. And for me, uh, personally, 25 years in the industry, I've seen a lot of change. I see a lot of young, new faces in the audience, which is fantastic, because we've got, we've got big problems with skill gaps at the moment. Um, we've got some very good people in the industry but we need new and up and coming people. So I'd encourage you to encourage those young grads to study this as a subject and to really make a difference. I want to make sure personally that the UK and in particular John Lewis and Waitrose is the number one place to uh, consumers to feel that they can trust us when they're online. And that's really important to me. So I want to make sure that we continue to be the brand that people trust, etc. And that can only happen with support from uh, OWASP and these types of organisations because unfortunately not enough is done out there in terms of putting the money in. Um, so that's it from me. Uh, I'm going to hand you back. If there, I just have to do a bit of housekeeping obviously. Um, there are toilets, there's one right there um, and then the others are there. 
if you hear the sound alarm, then you've got to run like hell. Um, the exits are over here and towards the back there. Um, don't follow me because I work in the building next door, so I don't know this building terribly well. Um, but many of my colleagues, uh, engineers, are here in the audience. Um, so just follow them, the ones with the green tags. Um, and other than that, we're not expecting any fire alarm tests. So if you do hear one, I'm afraid you please try and take an orderly exit out of the building. But um, thanks again. We really appreciate you coming this evening and we look forward to uh, welcoming you in the future. So, thank you. Thank you. Right, we're very short of time because of course you had to start there because of the stream. Very, very quickly, I'm going to uh, talk to people who don't know. Uh, these are some books and guides that OWASP produces code review guide, developer's guide, testing guide. If you want to know how to develop security, how to test applications for security, how to review the code for security vulnerabilities, we've got it for you. Uh, if you're doing mobile apps, I know you're doing it. John Lewis and the waitress definitely have a mobile app, right? So there are mobile security test testing guide, mobile application security verific verification standard, the software assurance maturity model, which uh, is absolutely free for you to download and use. Of course, everyone knows us as OWASP top 10 because we have top 10 application security risks. But there is a change coming up in November Right, so there will be a change, a new standard is going to be published. Right, uh, so as you know, the uh, proposal has been rejected, there are some changes. So uh, the, if you want to join this discussion, please join it. Uh, it's all available uh, for public. Uh, if you just search for OWASP Top 10 Public Discussion, you'll find it. Right, a bit of a message for the ladies in the audience. We, need, we want to attract more girls, so please do come and join. Security is a really cool subject. What we've got for you now is an initiative called OSWIA, or Women in AppSec. Uh, please Google it. Uh, the lovely ladies are happy to help uh, uh, fellow ladies with a career in cybersecurity and making it as a hacker, penetration tester, um, security champion. Uh, we've got it for you. Uh, conference in America just finished, uh, AppSec USA. The slides and videos are not available yet, but we expect them to be available on YouTube uh, within the next few days. There's a conference coming out called DevSec London for all the DevOps people who want to do DevOps securely, 19th and 20th of October. Those of you who are OWASP members can get 20% off the ticket. So um, um, uh, that's one of the member benefits you get. There's a free virtual conference coming up called All Day DevOps, which is a virtual conference. You can tune in at any time. There will be 96 sessions live, 24 hours streaming. Uh, Google it and please register and join. Uh, biggest hacker conference of the world, Black Hat, is coming to Europe this year again. It will be in London in Excel. Four days, two days training, two days there will be uh, sessions. Uh, OWASP is currently talking to Black Hat organizers to negotiate a discount. If it's available, we will post it on the mailing list, tweet it, Facebook it. Uh, so it's an expensive conference, but we hope to get some discount for you guys. Um, next very, very important thing I'm going to uh, tell you is elections are coming up. So um, this year, uh, we're going to choose four directors. Um, so uh, currently, the board consists of seven elected volunteers who serve a two-year term. Um, and what directors do, they are paid volunteers, and they dedicate uh, themselves to our mission and playing a pivotal role in the application security community. And they are responsible, with big power comes big responsibility, for setting the strategic direction of OWASP and make sure that financial integrity of our nonprofit organization is preserved. This year we have eight candidates and I'm pleased to announce that uh, OWASP on the chapter Khalida Sharif is one of the candidates. So he'll say a few words uh, before the break uh, about his mission for OWASP once he becomes a board member. Uh, we have Greg, who is the leader of OWASP San Antonio, Bill from OWASP Compliance Committee, Arthur he is a chief security evangelist of Parasoft, Steve is the head of OWASP Denver chapter. So, you know, Sharif is my uh, co-leader. Um, uh, Owen is uh, OWASP Dublin chapter leader. Uh, Milton Smith is the head of the OWASP security logging project. And Cheng Si Wang is the chief security officer of Twistlock. So these are the eight people that we will be electing starting from October 9th. So those of you who are OWASP members, please do vote. The voting will be open for one month and votes will be published on November the 7th. Um, we're looking for speakers. If you uh, have a great talk for us, please come and talk to us. Usually we have our talks on three main streams. 
breaking talks, how to break stuff, defending talks, how to defend the applications from being hacked. <coughs> and builders, if you want to build new projects, new tools to help developers to develop security. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Benji. Benji Frontai is coming uh, uh, to, uh, well, he's actually from Israel, so he flew in to present a few talks, including talk uh, here. And actually, he has to fly back to Israel in a couple of hours. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, yeah, those of you who uh, want to learn about containers, I'm quite willing to kick to learn about this. Um, um, will be please to uh, find out how the uh, containers work, what they are, and what are the security challenges when you're using application containers. There will be a live demo as well, so we hope that the gods of light demo are going to be nice to us and that you will be able to show us some live stuff. Thank you very much. Benji, you are live. You want to pick my mic? Uh, yeah, thank you. Mic. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, so good evening, everyone. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, Simon Sharif for giving me the opportunity to uh, speak tonight. Um, our topic is do containers enhance application level security? And just before I even start, by show of hands, how many people here are developing applications in containers today? All right, that's about 8 to 10 percent. Um, how many people have Docker on their laptops or playing with this? Not anymore. <laughs> okay, that's about 6%. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, Captain, yeah. So uh, what we're going to do today is talk about some of the uh, challenges, but also the way that containers can be used to enhance uh, application level security. A little bit about myself. Um, I am originally from England. However, today I live in Israel, very close to Tel Aviv. Um, today I run the DevSecOps department at Aqua Security. Aqua is a startup based in Tel Aviv that's focused on container security. Uh, prior to that, I spent a lot of time at Symantec and Bluecoat, uh, working on data center security and incident response. Uh, you're probably wondering what this picture is here. That is not myself as a child. Um, I'd probably still be in therapy if, if that was me. But I put this up there to remind me that I have a flight at 10 o'clock to go back to Israel. Um, so, uh, Suleiman, do not worry, I will finish on time, I promise you. So uh, let's get started. Anyone here use Ruby on Rails? Got to be people in this room. Have you used Ruby on Rails? Okay. Well, what we're going to do is I'm going to do a little experiment, and we're going to look at what it takes to install Ruby on Rails and, and deploy an application without containers, and then we'll look at what this looks like in containers. So a little shout out to Jim Brinkman at Grunt Work for some of the screenshots um, that I'm going to use over the next few slides. You get to work on a Monday morning, you're sipping your coffee, and you decide you're gonna use Ruby. Seems pretty simple. You log into your Linux box, and you do gem install Rails. So far, so good. You immediately are hit by the first dependency error, and you say, okay, that's all right. I just need to install make. So you think that's easy enough. I'm just gonna install make. You SSH into the box, you install make, and you once again try to install Ruby. Gem install Rails. However, this time, you notice that Zlib is missing. So you spent some time on Stack Overflow, and some very nice people provided the answer. You install Zlib, and then you once again try to install Rails. However, this time, the notorious Nokojiri dependency is missing. Just by the way, is this familiar? Does this resonate with anyone in the room? Anyone who has installed anything on Linux? Yes. OK, that's quite a few hands going up. So this is not unique to my experiences. This is pretty standard across the board. And as a very wise man once said, no Kajiri, why do you never install correctly? Now, as we will see, we did manage to install Rails after much effort. And you can see here, we actually started the new project. We are very happy at this stage. We finally have Rails running in production, and our boss is very happy. However, we now need to migrate that application from the developer's workstation into a production environment. How do we do that? So it's working on the developer's workstation. We are going to use Amazon. So we decide we're going to log into Amazon AWS, spin up some AMIs, and we're going to use that to deploy our Ruby on Rails application. However, everything that we did in our development environment has not been replicated to the cloud. 
So it's going to require a lot of effort for me to go and once again install all those dependencies in the production environment in Amazon. At this stage, you start getting violent and you realize there's absolutely no way you're going to go through this again. You tell your boss, I'm done with this project. However, she insists that you continue doing this application and therefore you spend some more hours on Stack Overflow and figuring out how to install all those dependencies, Zlib, Nokajiri, Make, and you finally have it running in Amazon. And this time, you said, I'm very, very happy. Finally, we are good to go. Why am I showing you all this? Not because you don't know what it takes, what a dependency is, but I'm going to contrast this in a second to what would happen if we were using containers to try and achieve the same thing. Once we are running in Amazon successfully, a week later we get an email saying there is a new critical vulnerability in Ruby on Rails, and the implications of that are I now have to update all my Rails applications with the latest version of Ruby. Okay? Seems pretty simple. We log into our Amazon uh, AMIs, and once again, we are missing a dependency to patch our Ruby. Okay, this is an underlying theme that hopefully by now you've picked up. And one of the key, I would say, uh, solutions that containers provide is portability. If a container works on your workstation and you're a developer, that container will run anywhere else. Okay, it will run in any cloud, in any environment. As long as you have a container engine, the same container will run. So what is a container? It's, I'm just, I, I can see a lot of people in the room actually are not using containers. So a container is a form of an application deployment making a process think it has a complete operating system and all the dependencies. Okay? There is no organization today, whether it's a bank, high tech, every industry is either starting to use containers in production or they are looking at how they can migrate their applications into containers. And as you can see here, the, the popularity of containers is rising exponentially every year. Okay? This is not a specific thing to any country, this is worldwide. Uh, as part of my role, I travel a lot in Asia and all over Europe. Everyone is moving to containers. And the key reasons are, number one, you can spin up a container in seconds. They scale in a very, very big way, and they run absolutely anywhere. The reason that you can spin them up in seconds, the average size of a VM is probably two or three gigabytes. The average size of a container is a few megabytes. So it takes usually a couple of seconds to spin up a container. So let's look at what is actually required if we want to create that same Ruby on Rails application using a container. There are two key components. The first one is a Docker image. A Docker image is essentially a compressed file. Think of it as a tar file or a zip file containing the underlying base image, the dependencies, and my application code. Okay? The person that creates this Docker image will be the developer. Then we have the container engine host, or the Docker host. And once the image is pushed into that container engine host, I can instantiate one or multiple containers to serve a specific business function. Okay? Um, again, the people that are responsible to create the Docker image are the developers. And we'll see soon that has some very broad reaching ramifications from a security standpoint. So how do we ensure, number one, that the container does not abuse the host resources? And if you contrast for a second a container to a VM, every VM, okay, you have the underlying hypervisor, but every VM has its own kernel. The reason that containers are so efficient is that they share the underlying kernel. So you have a Linux VM or a Linux host, and then each container is using the same underlying kernel using Linux namespaces. So that is very efficient and it's very productive. However, how do I ensure that I do not abuse the host CPU, network, storage, prevent things like a fork bomb attack where from within a container I can actually bring down the host. And the way there are different mechanisms available to do that, one is C groups, namespaces, uh, Linux kernel capabilities, and we'll see soon in a demo how easy it is if that's not configured correctly, via a container to actually bring down the host. So we discussed Ruby. We saw it the old way. Let's see how we would deploy our Ruby application with containers. So the first thing we would go is to Docker Hub. Think of Docker Hub as the repository for Docker images. It's pretty much like Google Play for your Android device. Um, there are many OWASP images in Docker Hub today, by the way. Uh, there's about 70 repos in there. 
And we search for Ruby, we can see that there are about over 10 million people have downloaded this Ruby image. Okay? The next thing we do is we create a very simple Docker file. And the Docker file is essentially defining what will this image do? What will the container, once this image has been deployed, do? So we're saying use Ruby, the latest version of Ruby. We're going to create a directory, use a source Maya. We're going to copy our source code into that directory. And then the default command that we're going to run once this container is instantiated. Once we set up this Docker file, that image gets pushed out to wherever I have my Docker engine running. And if it works again on my workstation, it will work in Google Cloud, Amazon, Azure, with whichever orchestration tool you're using. So this is one of the key reasons why so many uh, enterprise customers are adopting uh, containerized applications. Now, I have a question for you. There was a company, August 16th, that was recognized on the Forbes Top 10 100 list of the world's most innovative companies. Does anyone have any idea which company this was? Microsoft. Not Microsoft, no. <laughs> any, uh, any guesses? Anyone going to venture? OWASP. OWASP is probably up there, but I'm not sure if it was this year. Anyway, you'll probably not be surprised to know that the company was Equifax. Uh, three years running. Now, there are many things to learn from this. The first one is that there is absolutely no correlation between innovation and information security best practices. But maybe more importantly, if you look at the day that Equifax announced the breach, you can see the stock price of Equifax plummeted, uh, shaved about $4 billion off the company's revenue, the 25% of the market value. And the stock price was $143. Interestingly, the hackers there was the ingenuity, they impacted 143 million customers. Um, that's about half the population of the USA. Now the reason I'm showing you this, not because it's particularly interesting in terms of the stock price, but... Actually it is, because most of the time that isn't exhibited over more than a three day to couple week period. From most breaches in Equifax, possibly Deloitte and Sonic following, are currently the outlier versus the reality. Okay. Great. So the, the reason I was the reason I was going to show you this exploit was to talk about the vul specific vulnerability and how we would address that uh, if we were using containers and talk about the advantages and disadvantages. So um, just to reiterate, you're saying this was it, it, the fact sure. that it was an immediate happened immediately is an outlier. I think the fact that it happened to such a percentage degree is an outlier compared to most responses to breaches, even on the public market. There is a drop, it is sometimes drastic, it is often immediate, but it recovers quickly and it is not 30 out of 100. Okay, so this was extreme. Saying. Yes, and I like that. Okay, <laughs> so do you think, let me ask you quick, do you think that this is kind of, um, will make companies start taking this seriously? because of the financial? No, I think after, I think the hype cycle for this particular breach is gonna be elongated because so many other high profile breaches have happened since, between, and I say since, what was it, a week? Um, yeah. But I think the hype cycle will still fade. In a bad month, we're gonna go back to where we are. Okay, so we, that's a very positive way to uh, get to the next time. <laughs> uh, wow, okay, I thought you were gonna say actually that people may actually learn from this because the CEO has gone home, but Okay, so yeah, the hype cycle, you say, will last. I really like Keeping realistic. Yeah. yeah. I okay. appreciate your optimism. I'm sadly pessimistic. Sad. Okay. You're a realist, so uh, I respect mm -hmm. that. Yeah. My pessimism is not your fault. Continue, please. Okay. <laughs> we will continue. So let's look at the vulnerability that was actually exploited in Equifax. And there's still uh, in the community a lot of talk about what the exact vulnerability was. It's less relevant. What is important is that it was an Apache Struts vulnerability. Um, it essentially exploited, uh, it allowed a remote code execution um, using a plugin, okay, the Xtreme plugin, and the essential flaw was in how it deserializes um, untrusted data, in this case, XML. Now, you're all, everyone's familiar with the OWASP top 10, Sam mentioned this, obviously. Uh, the first one is injection, okay, it's still the number one attack vector is injection, and as is stated in the OWASP top 10, they often particularly uh, found in LDAP, XPath, and the queries, OS, XML parsers. So this is a classic injection attack. Um, and one of the interesting thing was, they're still talking about whether this 
took them two months, four months, or six months to detect the fact that a breach had occurred. That's less relevant for now. What is relevant is I'm going to show you an example a demo where I'm going to uh, use containers. Okay? Equifax was not using containers. And we have a victim container which is running uh, Apache Struts, the same version, which is obviously vulnerable. And then we're going to exploit that using a Python-based exploit, which will upload uh, a, a file and provide me a web shell as root in the container. So let's just take a look at that uh, and see what that looks like if we do that with containers. Do you need help with that? Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. So you can see here we have two containers. Um, these are both running, by the way, on the same VM. We have a victim container and an attacker container. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to spin up the victim container first. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. So victim is still attacker. Yeah. So this is our victim container. This is our attacker container. And the victim again is running Apache Struts. Um, we're gonna start that up uh, using a very simple script here. And this is essentially starting the container. So what's happening in the background is we're running a simple command, docker run, the name of the container, and it's going to spin this container up. Now, in the real world, you would have an orchestration tool, such as Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, or it wouldn't be actually someone manually doing this. But this is the container. Uh, we'll just check that it's actually started. Uh, we'll go into our browser and try and connect to this IP address of the container. Okay, so we have Apache running. We can also see that we have uh, struts running here. This is a very simple and stupid application um, where we can edit stuff and basically create dynamic uh, web content. However, if I try and go to my shell, um, this is currently unavailable, which makes sense because we haven't applied the exploit. So again, it's a Python-based exploit. Um, that's going to upload the WAR file, which is going to provide me back a uh, shell. Hopefully, if it works, I'll be root. So let's get that. Let's try and do that now. So if the demo works, we'll see here that the uh, file will be uploaded into the web app. So here we can see user local Tomcat web app. So that's using that vulnerability. Um, we've uploaded it by there using that exploit. If we now go back and do a refresh, we are provided with um, a, essentially and, well, we can do whatever we want. So if we run uh, who am I, we root. Um, we, can, we can do whatever we want. Uh, but the interesting thing is, if I show you uh, what processes are running on this, there is only one, uh, which is uh, Java. So can anyone tell me why we only have one process running here? It's a container. It's a container, exactly. So, from the attack service perspective, if this was a standard Linux box, I would have 20, 30, 40 processes running. Um, containers by design, um, and that's why they're so good for microservices, should have only one process running. So yes, I have one process running, um, but if the container, and this is the default behavior of containers, let me ask you a question. If I run um, this command, what do you think is going to happen? So this is a simple fork bomb attack. Essentially, it's a very primitive denial of service on the host. So it's a bash function that's going to go into an infinite loop and consume all the host CPU very quickly. And because we have not configured this container correctly, it hasn't been constrained in terms of what host resources it can use, we can bring down the host immediately. And remember that in a production environment, you will have hundreds or thousands, typically, of containers running on every host. So let's just see what actually happens if we run this uh, fork bomb attack. Um, I'm going to bring up in this window, let's move this over here to the side. So let's run top. And we can see here that right now we have 139 tasks running. Um, let's run the fork bomb hit run. Go back here and you'll see within probably about five seconds, if even less, it jumped up to 6,000. Uh, 8,000, and this is going to be exponential because it's an infinite loop. Within about uh, 40 seconds, this host is host. Uh, this is nothing new. This has been around in Bash for years. The reason I'm showing this is to explain that containers 
there are many, many advantages, okay? But if you don't configure it correctly, because it's an underlying shared kernel, um, this kind of thing can be uh, used in an attack uh, very easily. So let's go back to the presentation for a second. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, one thing that, by the way, the, uh, the script, what it does is obviously the share.wav file is base64 encoded. So when you upload it, you have to pipe it to base64. Now, should that container, we saw that only Java was running, should base64 even be allowed to be used on that container? The answer is no. And we'll see soon that if we shrink wrap the container as we should, uh, that attack could have been avoided, that exploit would have actually failed. And I'll show you in a second. So a simple question, if Equifax would have used containers, do we think that the impact of the attack would have been mitigated? So let's look at the very simple, uh, in, you know, the core requirements of the attack. Obviously, they had to compromise the server, the Apache Strat server. It had to be persistent. We know that the attackers were in, uh, in their environment for at least two, if not four months before they were detected. Um, they had to access additional uh, resources. There was probably lateral network movement. And finally, the exfiltration of the sensitive data, PII. So let's go through each of these. Number one, if they were using a container, what would have been compromised? Not the host, the container. Does that mean that potentially they could have not got to the host? The answer is no. But they would need to use a kernel level exploit, something like Dirty Cow, to break out of the container and get into the <laughs> host, okay? Uh, which obviously would require a lot more resources. Would it have been less persistent? The answer is yes. Why? The average life cycle of a container is six hours, okay? Again, the orchestration tool are spinning up the containers as is needed to serve specific business <coughs> functions, and therefore the hackers would have essentially, in every single instance, had to keep doing what they were doing every few hours because there was no, it's very, very hard to, to kind of get this con uh, persistency that they had if containers, so if containers are ephemeral by, by nature. The containers are based on the image. Um, containers cannot be updated in real time, and that's why, from that point of view, the persistency would have been a lot harder. Containers use an overlay network. An overlay network means that the network would have been hopefully segregated. Usually there is communication between the, on the same host between the containers, but it would have been a lot harder. And because as we saw, it, it, there was only one process running, the Java process. So in terms of the attack surface, it would have been a lot less, okay? Usually you have all the other processes running on a standard Linux box. So let's just talk about microservices for a second. This is a monolithic application. These are how traditional applications are built. Um, this is the same application broken down into microservices, subcomponents that provide a very specific function. And that's why containers facilitate this in such a great way, as we saw before. And if you think about the same attack, if we would have taken out one microservice, the other containers are not necessarily affected, okay? Which is a great thing. So, if this was a logging uh, microservice, this was uh, a backend, that's, you know, this is broken down. The fact that I managed to compromise one of those microservices means that the other ones are usually going to remain uncompromised. So just to wrap up what we're talking about, if I sh did shrink wrapping for this container and actually locked it down as I should have done, that exploit that I just showed you, that Python-based exploit would have failed because I would not have been able to upload the shell.wav file and the decode base64 encoding would have also failed. So does containers enhance security? No. This is not a yes or no thing, okay? First, who said no? Okay, David. So the answer is essentially yes, if they are configured as they should be configured, okay? You can say the same about the host, right? If it's hardened properly, then you have no problem. Correct, however, and what I- If your application written properly, you have no problem. The, so containers, uh, containers, depending on how they are configured, by default, there are many challenges that have to be addressed. Let me ask for a volunteer. Can I take anyone's laptop and just put in a USB disk for a second? You can try sure. <laughs> There you go, it's a Mac. Uh, okay, good, that was the response that I was hoping for. Okay, no one's crazy here, no one's gonna take a USB key and plug it in. However, when you take the Docker image that you download from Docker Hub and you plug it in to the Docker engine, it extracts what's there and runs whatever is in that image. Okay, it's, it's like plugging in a USB key and having auto run INF. The developers, again, who create these Docker images are not aware of the underlying 
what the contents of the Docker images. They can, they can be vulnerabilities, patchy struts, or anything else. And the developers are also not trained usually or security aware, which is why anyone in this room who is doing security with DevOps teams will start to become aware that it's actually these guys, the developers who create the Docker images that have to be empowered from a security standpoint. We cannot impose security in production anymore because the underlying base image, it's not who decides whether you're gonna use Ubuntu, Alpine, or CentOS. It's not the operations team, it's the developer. When the developer creates this Docker image, they decide which operating system is gonna be used, and that is a whole new paradigm that anyone that's doing operational security uh, needs to look at. So if we take Ruby as an example, uh, go back to our great Ruby container that we created at the beginning of the presentation, in the latest version, there are currently 20 critical vulnerabilities in the Ruby image, and that's not unique to Ruby, it's the same across the board. So obviously, from that point of view, we need to do a lot of work in understanding what vulnerabilities are in those images, what the contents of those images are. Um, and like I said before, the developer controls the full stack. Okay? Um, everyone's heard CI CD pipeline. Okay, so continuous integration, continuous deployment. What this means is that an, in an enterprise organization with containers, they are releasing multiple iterations of code released into production every day. That means the security has to be baked into the process and completely automated. You cannot wait until that application is in production and try and impose a security. So usually DevOps teams will use tools like Jenkins, Microsoft VSTS, GoCD, and there are many, many mechanisms that can be used to bake in the security into that. We're not talking about static code analysis. This does not replace static code analysis. This is after you've done static code analysis, we're now securing the infrastructure of that application, okay? The code, once it's been compiled, gets pushed into a Docker image, and all the traditional security tools that we have, that we'll see in a minute, don't have visibility. So your average vulnerability scanning tool, whatever you use, doesn't know what a Docker image is. Um, your intrusion prevention system is not gonna be seeing uh, an exploit, a, a malicious payload in the network traffic because that traffic remains within the Docker host. So there's a lot that we have to do to educate ourselves as security people, understand how these containers work, and then create new processes uh, to address this. So there are many open source vulnerabilities, like I said, within the official Docker images. Uh, privilege escalation is, is easy if there is an underlying kernel vulnerability like Dirty Cow. We saw an example of fork bomb attack. Secrets management is, is a huge issue around containers. Secrets are essentially uh, how does one container or one microservice authenticate to another microservice, okay? So it can be an SSH key, AWS token. The easiest way for a developer to do this is to just bake that into the image in clear text, okay? So we need a mechanism to securely inject the secret into a running container so it can talk to a database microservice or talk to another microservice but if anyone else gets that image, they do not have access to that secret, okay? And there are different ways of doing that, we're not gonna get into all of them now. So DevSecOps is a, a buzzword that many of you have heard, okay? Traditionally, there has been friction between development and security. One thing containers are definitely providing is they're helping foster collaboration between the teams. Many of the biggest banks in the UK and across Europe have this DevSecOps role and this person, what he does is he, he's kind of a broker. He's talking to development and talking to security and helping security team apply their controls within DevOps, okay? Shifting the security to the left. Anyone heard this? Shifting left, okay. So yes, it's a buzzword, but it also means that all, everything that we've done in production, hardening of the servers, patch management, that all has to be done now in the Docker image. And who creates the Docker image? Developers. No, a random person. The random person on the internet creates the image, but then the developer pulls that image down. And do nothing with it, just put it down. He puts it in their Docker file. He pushes his code into that image, but as you said, he doesn't, he doesn't understand what is in the underlying image. And if you take any tool, vulnerability scanner, it's not gonna be able today, at least, to open up um, that Docker image. So, thank you very much for your time. I'll Questions, just, I'll yes. Just, I'll just throw something in there. So, yes. Yeah, you can go and get the image and download that, and it's great to prototype and play with. But it's not like the image is yeah. secret. Oh, shit. <laughs> 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 yes, 
Could you please voice the reaction? No, so, so what I wanted to just mention, um, there's this, this uh, promotion of um, just going up and downloading an image. Uh, there have been a couple of tools released a year or so that were going through and spidering all these different images to try and detect what might be uh, potential security vulnerabilities to highlight to the image authors. <coughs> so what I would recommend is, within the SEC DevOps world, DevSecOps, whatever you want to call it, there's a security first, there's a security by design attitude. So even with the release early, release software, even the CICD, that's all baked in as part of that. Mm -hmm. And what people should be doing is, yeah, prototype, get around papers. So when you're actually getting, getting something going into a pipeline, mm -hmm. you build all those baseline images that you're pulling from in the first place. Yeah. You're putting in your controls. Because in terms of the app stack, we've been seeing the Node.js poison, we've seen PyPy poison, yep. obviously Gems being poisoned. Mm -hmm. There has to be a way to continually maintain that and have that, that check to, to make sure. And if you don't take ownership of the whole chain, you will be spent. I agree. Yes. So, yeah. Honestly. Great, great point. Uh, this is the CICD pipeline is not just doing the security at the beginning, at the left. It's a continuous process. For example, on a Monday morning, you may push out an image, which is fine, but if a new vulnerability is discovered in that image and it's deployed across your containers, you need to have a mechanism in place to control that, to deploy the new image. So I agree 100%. But again, what's key here is that the existing processes that are used today for patch management, for example, are just not relevant. Today, you can log into your Linux box and update a patchy with SSH. With a running container, there is, there is no SSH in there. So you don't have to go back and rebuild the image. Yes, but I would count. <laughs> Microphone, there you go. Yes, but I would count that. In fact, a lot of these images are now actually being run through things like shared public Ansible CF engine, which is providing our infrastructure to code things to the container environment. So, yes and no. Thank you. Another question at the back. Hi, thank you. Um, are you seeing so just to referencing that process of the developers having more uh, responsibility really around making sure the security controls are applied? Are you seeing, uh, or would you suggest perhaps the process should be more like almost effectively? It's like an app store. So the idea is that rather than allowing the developers to download the images from the from the websites and open source forums, there's effectively a, a level of assurance, security assurance, with the security teams applying the controls around that set of approved and secured images. So developers can only really be working from those and discouraging them to be perhaps doing what they are used to doing at the moment, which is sounds like more of a cultural problem than a, than a process problem. So the answer is absolutely yes. Um, that it is firstly a cultural problem. It's not something that any technical tool can address. And number one, yes. So there has to be some kind of mechanism that vets the image, okay? When it's used by the developer. So the developer may just go into Docker Hub, pull down whatever image they want. But before that image is pushed into the registry, there has to be a mechanism in place which checks the contents, looks for secrets, looks for vulnerabilities. However, once that moves, from the registry into production. Again, there has to be additional mechanisms there that continuously check A, the image, but also protect the runtime. So once the containers are already running, okay, we still need to secure the running containers. And that's not just about the images, that's about what can the running container do, uh, whether it's abusing the host resources or anything else. It's half past seven, your flight. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you very thank much, Benji, thank you. Thank you. Right, uh, so uh, before we move on to the break, I think Sharif wants to say a couple of words about uh, being the wire, being kind of the board member. And then we'll have a break. Yeah, and then we'll have a break. So, before we run and have some beer. Hi, everyone. So, as you know, I'll be running for the board um, uh, this year. And actually, I was going to answer a question that Benji asked uh, recently, which is, this is a lot of work, and how do we find the energy and the time for it? And the reason for it is that we're quite passionate about what we do, and we quite like it. So, oh my god, we got Benji to talk about container security. We're having Simon and Malik talk about um, bug bounties. We have um, Jeremy King to talk about PCI compliance and um, just all the problems that are going uh, forward. And we've got someone to the pen test partners. Uh, to talk about uh, IoT devices before the massive wave of DDoS attacks. And yeah, yeah. Um, 
So yeah, we, we did it because we're quite passionate about what we do in the community. And for example, the videos and the live streams, the reason why we've done it is because we get drunk, we drink a lot, and sometimes we forget some of the talks about the DC 4420 um, as well. That and wasn't the talk, that was the many shots of Jaeger a certain vendor bought us after. <laughs> yes, but that's one after another after another evening. That that is exactly how the evening yes, that's went. how it yes. works. Yeah, but and that's why it's like God. If I just had it recorded, I would can go back and just remember what this guy said. Uh, and that's why we did it. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to join the board is to continue to do this, to continue to be able to help the rest of the chapters and the community at large. And the two things that I will be able to provide, the first one is good uh, corporate governance. So I'm actually a, me on a member of the board uh, in, a, in a company. I've actually been um, certified from the Institute of Directors and on my way to become a chartered company director. And it might sound something really cheesy or like simple, like good corporate governance, but if a company or an organization cannot effectively work as a team, if we can't effectively um, help, then communication is poor, things are just moving slowly, um, and the community suffers. And ultimately, this is a community. It's a community that needs to be energized, needs to enjoy what they're doing, and passionate. And out of that, they build um, interesting software, they build uh, best practices, and ultimately, well, that's why people come here. And that's why I want to come, and that's essentially the strategy for us, is to have a community that is energized, that is able to build these interesting um, software, security tools, and also uh, the best practices. But thank you. Okay, guys, so our uh, project will open soon. I will actually have the first endorser. This is the head of uh, ISSA UK, Gabe Turner. Gabe, what is this? Sharon has no idea I was planning on doing this because I came up with this plan around 20 seconds ago. <laughs> right. Um, so, learning that Sheriff is running for the International Board and listening to him sell himself here, I thought I'd join in. Um, how many of you here are OWASP active members? More of you should raise your hands, please. But in any event, those of you who are, um, Having run an association in the UK in this field for a number of years, I can say that the quality of the events and the attendance at the events, and I look around at this room and say that very clearly, is an extraordinarily clear indicator of the quality of the leaders and organizers of those events, that being Sherry and Sam. OWASP London has underseen a massive revitalization since Sherry and Sam came on board. Sherry is running for the International Board, and I think that this room is an attendant on his skills. You should consider that, and then you should consider one other factor. Having run elections for my own professional association for years or been involved in them, I can tell you stats like 10 to 15 percent of people internationally tend to bother, bother voting. An active member community who believes their leader can improve things internationally, even a single city's worth, can actually change the course of an election. So if you like how OAS London, London is doing, consider voting for the man standing to my left. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, let's take a short break for uh, beer and snacks and uh, then, then we can be for the uh, final talk of the day. Thank you. Uh, thank you.
I mean, I'm oh, sorry, let's be honest, between you and me, and you're going to have a baby, you're going to stitch, you have tons of time. Yeah, <laughs> it, it actually starts only in, uh, uh, in January. Do you really want to do that? So, like, I just want to speak about it. Like, you have to go to the beach. Oh, you have to go to the beach. It's really good. It's also on your voice. Je peux de côté sécurité, mais plutôt c'est la source d'internet. Oui, oui, comment Put on, put on. You can talk in English. <laughs> Yeah. Um, 
So you guys work like you do security work? Right, Zap is not the person you ask for. Oh shit, nice to meet you. I'm Chris. second speaker is very exciting. I waited for many, many months trying to get him to come and speak at OWASP London. Um, those of you who don't know him, I don't know if you just Google uh, Suleiman's name, you will find out that this guy has been absolutely amazing because I started learning about him from Twitter, from LinkedIn, from uh, Microsoft and LinkedIn, security acknowledgements, it's the same name happening everywhere. Suleiman Malik, Suleiman Malik himself. Who is this guy? Why is he finding bugs everywhere? In LinkedIn, in Yahoo, in Microsoft, and uh, even US Department of Defense, uh, big, big names, big brand names saying, oh, many thanks to Suleiman Malik for his brilliant security research and some critical security vulnerabilities that he's discovered and responsibly disclosed to us. Um, so, can you please take your seats and watch the next up? So, Suleiman, it's all yours now. Uh, good, evening, good evening, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Solomon, and I'm an independent security researcher. So let's go get started from my background. So already Sam told you about it. So you probably have read it. And I'm an independent security researcher. I'm a finder of shoes. Mine's not working. Mine's not working. Speak up. Speak up. Uh, Sam, there's the wearable mic you just blew into is working. The mic he is holding is not. Okay. 
sure both are working. Yeah. Give me both. Okay, with the stereo sound. We have the technology. <laughs> You might put, put down that one. No, you want one microphone. Yeah, no. <laughs> we can hear you in stereo. So, so you can hear me. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think. I'm sure. Just uh, speak straight. All right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, Sam already showed you about my background, so let's get started with the uh, bug hunting techniques that. <coughs> Actually, I'm a final year student. I'm studying uh, computer forensic and security from Leeds University. And um, anyway, let's get started. You already have ready. So, so overview. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, session hijacking, uh, hacking Huawei accounts, into remote code execution, account target takeover in Cisco, uh, password validation bypass in a BlackBerry, post message with vulnerability, and subdomain takeover, and all that token stealing. So, starting from the session hijacking. Okay, so I have reported this vulnerability to the top organization, including Oracle, Shopify, iCloud, SourceForge, and so on. The, the developer actually do a mistake. What they do, actually, the, log the, uh, the logout function is not properly implemented in most of the web applications. What they actually do, the logout function does not destroy a cookie from the backend server. It actually destroys a cookie from the frontend server, which is a uh, frontend system uh, from the Victor browser. If the cookie is still valid from the backend server, anyone having uh, attacker having a cookie can validate the cookie from the backend server and can portion it with them. So now, do what actually they do mistakes. They destroy cookies from the front, uh, front side, from the user browser, not from the backend server. And attacker can easily uh, get a session ID, a token, or session cookies. He can just import a session cookies in his browser. He can portion it after even the victim is locked out. Now the vulnerability chaining. If you have, if you if you are able to find an XSS vulnerability with session hijacking inside any website, so you are likely able to compromise any one account simply by transferring cookies using XSS and then importing cookies. With um, there are two things like the cookies manager, which is Firefox add-on. You can import export cookies through that, and that is still work on Facebook. Where is that? I'm asking. Facebook, yeah? You need to be able to hijack the session and be authenticated. It's still possible, but actually, Facebook actually has a more security, so we have to look at everything before we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, you can, like, uh, you can, yes. with this add on, you can uh, import cookies, export cookies, and uh, you can edit the cookies in order to exploit some of the kind of vulnerabilities. So, you can also test this kind of vulnerability inside the group suite by simply grab the request, send it to the peer, log out from the account, and run the request. If you're able to change any detail inside the session, then you're likely able to find this. So now I'm coming to my recent researches, which is a Huawei endpoint vulnerability. I was able to compromise any account of Huawei. And always I targeted website profile section. So when I logged into my account, I went to the uh, profile section, uh, profile sex, uh, setting. This is a profile setting area. I just fill up this form and simply grab the request before submitting it to the server. So the request was something like web account .web .com, it's a personal post, and it's a JSON update reg back, as you can see that. So what happened after that? When I filled this form and grabbed the request, the request was some, something like that, which is the endpoint, and uh, as you can see that it's a JSON update reg back, and after that, there is a user ID which was vulnerable yeah, in this case. And there is another thing that I found inside the Huawei, which was uh, whenever you create an account, it the numbers are incremented by one. <laughs> then, you, it, then you can hack any one account, that's me. So after that, I was just uh, I just simply changed the name with a hack by Suleiman, hack by last name is Malik, and email is my own. I have created a random email just for testing purpose. So this is a branding email and leave the rest. I just simply don't go for this. All right, just, just start today. So then I logged out from my account. I simply paste the request in a URL, I, even though I have a, a, no active session in my Huawei, and still I was able to get this message. Acknowledge code one, message user update information successfully. Like, um, 
It's a JSON form. It's a, it's a JSON format. Then I create another another account, and within after the second, uh, because I actually created both account at the same time, and the second account was 80. So this. I grabbed the request from 80 account and tried on 79, which was previously created. And uh, what, what I found that when I went to uh, login screen, I uh, entered that email address, which was replaced with the which, uh, with the victim email. Now I'm able to log in to that account, and that's all the information was changed, replaced with my details. And uh, as you can see, that the logged in with this Solomon Malik, just for clearing it. I'm going to show you a video, a live hacking video. You'll find it. Just one second. Okay. It's a live hacking video. This is an uh, incognito browser. As you can see, that there is no session, even just asking for a username and ID. And I'm going to uh, copy that code, uh, the URL, and paste it here. So you can see that the, the paste in there, yeah? There is no active session. And in a few minutes, I will replace the page, and you will see the information will be changed. All right, so I got this user information successfully. Let's go to the main account now. This is the main profile. Everything has been replaced with my detail. There is no tech token wars. There was no CSRF token, nothing else. No security measures. Everything has been hacked. No cookie. No cookie. <laughs> <laughs> I want a cookie. So. Now I'm going to confirm it that I have no active session and I'm able to hack anyone account. It's still asking for this uh, web browser. Asking for a login. You can't replace the email from within the setting, but you can do it from outside the endpoint. So this was video. Anyway. So let's come to the next one, which is a remote code execution on Intel. I'm sorry about the graphic quality because I actually downloaded this image from Pentest Magazine because I have disclosed this research to them. And I wasn't able to find the actual screenshots. So hopefully you can understand it. Anyway, um, I was actually surfing the website at Intel and I found that I have an arrow on WebAlyzer, which actually tells me how many applications and what type of application works in the background of this web server. So I found that the, uh, their site is using AngularJS. So if their site is using AngularJS, there is a pro possible, possibly you can find remote code execution. Or you can say server-side template injection, SSTI. So I just simply went to the user for personal information setting. I changed my name with the first three uh, characters, which is SUL. And in curly brass, it's 999, and the same in the last name, Molly and 999, to test the vulnerability. Now I have to see, uh, now I have to check that where my name is reflected. If 999 is converted to 81, then it means I can execute some payloads here. So I tried it, and more, I, work, I was working for more than two hours and uh, couldn't find it. Because uh, wherever it reflected, it was like 999. 999 is not like 81. So finally, the next day, uh, on the next day, I was uh, just trying to play around with this thing. And finally, I came to a uh, password reset uh, function area. So I just simply reset a new password. And uh, I got an email on my account. The email was something like that. Dear soul, A1, like A1. 999 has been converted. Then I applied this code, which is a payload uh, from a JS, uh, AngularJS. File get content and etc. password and everything uh, from PHP to um, the test. 
tag was open and closed yet. I just simply put in my first name, and what I got was Dear Soul, and nobody started from here. All the passwords. Passwords. Inside, internal passwords, everything. So I have just blurred out the material. And the Molly one, as I left it as it is. So this was my second research that I've disclosed it to them. Okay. So whenever you see that uh, if the site is using Angular, uh, just try using these things. Because if you, if you play around these things, you will be able to find something. And something will make you more passionate about it if I tell you about how much bounty I earn. Anyway, uh, so this is the third vulnerability, which is a Cisco CSRF cross-site request bridgery attack. So I always target, as I told you before, I always targeted the user setting area. This time, I found that the, on the back side, there was a token, as you can see that in here. This is a token value, and the server has the same value. If the, and token always, uh, the CSR generator always generate a different tokens, and it's, it must be validated on the server side before. Otherwise, if the token is, does not match with the server token, it will simply uh, withdraw all inf information or fail it, you know. So I just uh, went down there and uh, checked the source code of that page, which is a user setting page, and I found that this code is being used here. So I thought that there is a 90% chances that I'm unable to hack or compromise any account here. So I just simply fill up the form with the name of Peter D'Souza, which is user ID is mine, and this is a testing ID is everything, right? Then I went to the next stage, as you can see that, which confirms that I got this ID. This is the email confirmation that I have this ID has been created on my email. Now, this is a complete uh, proof of concept code where I exploited the vulnerability. As you can see that there is a token code. The all requests will be successful if the token matches with the, to uh, with the code or token, which is on the server side. So obviously, I had to remove the code first to test what, what will happen. And when I remove the code, leave the values and full t uh, form, as it is, and um, you know what happened after that, say, see, you know, missing CSRF token, the user information is not updated because it, the CSRF token is missing. So then I, what I did, it was a very simple vulnerability. I just simply removed the full line. I removed the full line and server did not validate it. And its user information was updated, everything. On the next slide. Everything, all the information is mine and it was replaced with the victim. So, all right, so, but then after, if you're able to run CSRF and you're able to like change their details, then this is very simple. If you don't know the password, for example, in some cases you don't, you don't have a password, you can simply reset the password by uh, requesting a new password section on your attacking email. And you know what happened after that? This account was created by me. And I have this account, and after that, the email was replaced. The blue site is already closed. You have to use the main address. Thank you. Okay, so. <laughs> so this email actually I created an uh, account on Cisco, and it was working at that time. Then after the hacking into and replacing the email, I I can't. Uh, let's suppose I'm a victim now, and I'm came back to uh, public <laughs> session because I want to. I want my e email account back. So when I entered my email address here, it says you, we did not recognize your email. So it means you have lost everything. All progress is lost. If you have an account or if you have a credit card information in your account, everything is lost because you can't back, get it back from here. So, and victim will no longer be able to access his account after that. If you are, so this vulnerability has a high impact because victim can't recover his account. So then I went back to after resetting the password, I came back to with a new email and logged into my account and found that the information was replaced again with the Cisco, which is a, one of the most well-known organization. And they were actually suffering from this group. Anyway, so, okay. Now we came to the next slide, which is a password validation bypass in BlackBerry. I think so. I have a video, live hacking videos for CSRF and Cisco, but it's, I think it's a 10 minute video. It's a long video. So I'm not going to play it. I'll share the link on my Twitter. It's already on here. I'll share the link for my YouTube channel so you can watch a lot of 
live videos because these videos are proof of concept and I've submitted these videos to the renters and after that I have disclosed these videos on my account. So that's but I will show you this one anyway. So the password validation bypass, if you accidentally access someone's account, you can you you probably have seen that if you try to change the email or other setting you need a password before saving. Now I accidentally access someone's account, and I don't know the password, but I want to compromise his account. I want to hack his account, right? I just simply change the email, and enter the wrong password, leave it blank, and say it's the password, uh, invalid password, or password must be entered, something like that. So what I did, actually, I simply opened the inspector, inspector element, and uh, who is this one? this line, which is actually a password section. This code is from the source code. I simply delete this code, this line, this box, and the password section, and the same thing happened. When the box is here, it will validate it. If the box is not here, it, will, it won't validate it on the server side. And I was able to hack their account as well, the BlackBerry. So, no parameters, no slash form, no validation. That's a big mistake from the developers, because they don't validate them server side. Okay, so I have tested the same thing in a bur using a burp suite. As you can see that, after I uh, have grabbed a request before uh, saving my personal detail, in the gra I grabbed a request, as you can see that the form ID password, this is uh, just a rough figures, and form ID password, this is a new password and confirm new password. I simply remove this password line, not only the password, but I have to remove this complete parameter. So once the parameter is not there, it won't be validated on work server side. And that's it, you are likely to hack into the account. When I came back to the account, the username was changed. As you can see, the hack by 73 at gmail.com and all information has been changed out without knowing their password. So, re so once the email changed, there is a one easy step, request a new password on your attacking email and you will get a new password from a victim account. So this was my third or fourth, fourth research. I'm going to show you this one first. for saving your security question. And this time, I'm using a verb suite. When I entered the wrong password, it gave me an error because it was validated from server side. to JSON and XHL calls headers and other method of sending the data between two origins. It was introduced in the HTML5. Now I'm going to show you where it actually the wonderful point is. When application communicate with another application, it must have a sender and receiver sites, yeah? So to send a message to an application, simply call the post message function on the target windows. So on the target windows dot post message, this is a pitfall one. And this one is a pitfall two, so let's go for the pitfall one. This is a sender. So target windows are post message, hello world, and origin is wildcard, which means any. It could be a hacker. It, they should have something restrict. They should have something uh, same origin or same origin policy should be applied in this section because they have a wildcard here. Now an even listener can listen to 
can listen from anywhere, and it could be attacker server. Okay, so this is a first pitfall because it's sending this message to wildcard to every server. So attacker can simply import his own uh, server URL, and he will be able to cache this message. Now the second pitfall is here. Even handler can register on the CCing side, and where we can watch it, I will show you in the next slide. So Windows are yet add even message. The, the problem is, and the receiving side, developer actually forgot to, which you uh, forgot to filter the incoming, incoming by packets. So, so re the receiver must validate the origin from. Uh, of the message with the message of origin attribute, and if the regular expression is used to validate the origin, it's important to escape the character and the dot since just code. So where are the vulnerability now and the receiving side? So this is, for example, is on exemplereceiver.com, and the code is window.add even listener message function message. And as you can see that, officer.com, I put the dollar, a forward slash, dot test, and message, right? It would not only allow the message from examplecenter.com, but also allow from www. If there is a no dot, is an A. So now attacker can register this domain and can simply do anything. Like they can pop up anything inside their website, by right? because there is an only simple problem that there is this full stop, which is a tail dot. You can find a post message in your. Uh, Chrome Dev Tool, and under the source section, under the source section, if you can see that there is a is a global listener, the global listener, and down there is a message, and there are two messages. It means, as you can see that here is a I have opened YouTube, add even listener and Windows dot even listener. So you can find this uh, even listener from there, and you have to read the code. If you see any wildcard there, just simply report them. Or if you if you are able to exploit this vulnerability, as I told you in the previous slide, you can go for it. You can test it. You can just register these domains and try it as much as you can. If you're engaged with the vulnerability, you probably get a higher bounty. And if you find something very common and just simply report to them, they will give you like hundred dollars. But if you engage with the vulnerability and find the impact, and if you, if you get higher impact, probably you will get a three to ten thousand dollars. It depends. All right, so you can check a page is registered as a, the page has a registered message listener and which is script registered by using a Chrome Dev tool, right? And a lot of third-party scripts uses a post message communicator. Most people actually I have spoke to uh, some of them and they say, they said actually we don't use a post message, but they are using a third-party services. But they never know about, you never know about if the third-party service is using a post message to communicate with another application. So. Always, if, you, if you're not using the post message service, but still you have to check each and everything in the third party side. As it, a lot of third party scripts use a post message to communicate with the third party service, so your application might be using the post message without your knowledge. Okay, so this is only one slide for the subdomain takeover, because I'm um, not going to mention that. There's a, there's a lot of other details, that's three buckets and all the other things, so I'm just going from the simple way to find out how you can do that. Mm -hmm. First of all, you have to search the domain, uh, the subdomains. You can use any tool, a Python-based uh, tool, like a sublister, a DNS dumpster. It will list all the subdomains. Then you have to, you have to check it one by one using, uh, you can use some sites, NSLOOKUP or CNAME or host, example.com or CNAME, info.hacker1.hacker1.one, because the hacker.1 was hacked so many times because it was pointing something to unbouncespages.com. So when we check the host, uh, host hacker one, hack, info .hacker one, we got this. As you can see that the C name is pointing towards unbouncespages.com. We went there, we were two guys, we went there, we, what we did actually, we tried to claim this domain on their side. And once the, we, we are able, we successfully claimed that domain, and we put some, we add some contents like uh, pop-ups, XSS, and all these things, and we were lucky able to get that already. So when we reported to the vendors, they actually awarded us a $2,000 bounty in the first attempt, and the second attempt, it's a $3,000 $3, bounty, and the fourth attempt, $500.
the same actually you are just going to do it again and again <laughs> because they were actually leaving us some spaces they were leaving some loopholes here every time and we were able to bypass that security so this is where you say like uh, if you want to t test a subdomain of your website or your web server just simply list all the domains check their uh, C name or if you're a bug hunter if you want to try other website you can simply use that commands C name false name or just if, if you see something like a C name is pointing towards some other site or third party site, just go for that. Just go there, sign up your email, sign up your account, and try to claim that domain there. If you were if you were successfully claim that domain, you, you can do anything. You can put a fake form, you can do a social engineering techniques in order to grab some private credentials. Alright, so the last one is uh oh, oh was open in standard for authorization, commonly used as a, for internet. And most actually, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Twitter, all of them actually using the OAuth uh, for, uh, without exposing their password, is it? The network. In this attack, the attacker presents uh, the victim with the URL to authentication portal that the victim trusts, like Facebook. We have already seen in so many sites that there is a box that like uh, login with your Facebook, login with the Twitter. So there is this kind of whenever you can on that area. So authentication portal that victim trusts like a Facebook and by using the authentication portal to the victim secret access token is delivered in HTTP server controlled by the attacker. Okay, so I'm going to show you how you can bypass this kind of vulnerability. You probably have seen that whenever you try to log into Google, Microsoft, you have to, you're likely able to see these things as well. The redirect URI and all these things are how you, you can bypass it. So there are different ways. You two, there, these are some payloads, which is a person 2F, 2F is a forward slashes, person 5 is a backslashes, person 3 is a question mark, 23 is a hash, and 40 is a thread. So the, you can, you have to test all of them. You may be fine, you, you may be fine in any of them. Like, so this is example requests, and uh, example.com socialized like in client ID, redirect URI, victim.com and provide the Facebook and response type as a token. All we need to steal the precious token. Once we steal the precious token, we can hack or you can log into their account very easily. So an example request, now you have seen that. And a forge request is something, as you can see that the redirect URI, because it's sending the token back to the, uh, so, uh, back to the website where you came from now. So the, the website is example.com. What we did actually, we put we did person two app, person two app, which is a forward slashes, and then dot victim.com. Now what will happen? The response was some, something like that: example.com forward slashes dot victim.com. It means the code has sent to both domains. Now we have precious token. We can log into their account. So, it's, so sometimes actually it doesn't work. The forward slashes doesn't work. You have to try the backslashes instead of forward slashes. Do person three f or hash hash as you probably know about the hash is uh, anything that comes after the hash won't validate it on server side. Whatever is it, you can put your name after the hash. It won't be validated on server side, and you'll get your web page. So you have to try each all all of these uh, symbols. There might be dollars. You can use a dollar. You can use a pound. Any any kind of symbol to test this kind of vulnerability. And all right, so this is the last slide for, for my side. If you have any question re related to any of research, anything, share it. Yeah. Thank you. I had a question on the info dot uh, yeah. hacker one. Did you actually have access? Uh, yeah. If you go back. Yeah. So the canonical name. Does that mean you are also acting as info.hacker1? Or just simply the uh, unbounced pages? We went to what we did actually. After, when we looked for uh, their C name, and it was pointing, the C name was pointing toward unbounced pages. And when we tried to access on our port 80 in a web browser, it says nothing. A, the page was blank, right? What we did, and we went to the unboundedspages.com. On unboundedspages.com, we tried to, uh, what we did actually, we created an account there. We, we asked for a domain, subdomain, because it's a service yeah. for subdomains in it. 
So in the Oscar subdomain, we put that subdomain and we claim that. We are able to, once you are able to claim that domain, you can do anything with it. So we claim that domain. Now the hacker one company can't claim again. I have full control over this subdomain now. So, okay, hacker, so you have this full control of info dot info dot hacker dot okay. one now. So the other thing that you can do is that some companies, because they have so many subdomains, the their session cookies is set to parent. Right. Which means that if you've logged in or so on, and the pages point to info dot hacker run somewhere, you're Sarah. also sending the hookie. Sorry, you're. Um, so the reason why I brought it up is that if the browser actually sees unbounced pages as info.hacker1, and if hacker1 sets the session cookies to parent, it means that old subdomains will receive the session cookies. And if it's pointing to info, that means that you will receive everybody's session cookies as they're pointing to you and log them. We and can do anything, right? Yeah, we, we can compromise anyone account with, with it. Yeah. Yeah, it's very simple. We can uh, compromise anyone account if you have, if you, if you are the owner of this domain. Then. Yeah, that's it. You can post some kind, of, you know, so you can do a social engineering technique and post some form, fake forms on their website, and ask for their details. Whenever they enter the details, it will be sent to your server, so you can <laughs> see anything. Okay, uh, can I ask the second question that uh, yeah. I have a simple? Uh, can you go back to the OAuth page? Because I think this is awesome, right? Because that means that you can actually hack in as, uh, it was at the next slide. Um, you, you, you can actually log in as a user. I know there was a recent vulnerability in uh, our Office 365. Who here is using Office 365? So, okay. So, OAuth vulnerability existed in Office 365, which means anyone could log in as anyone in your organization, right? And read anyone's emails, okay? Microsoft fixed this only, only, Right, I think about seven months ago. So, how long Office 365 has been in use? Okay, so, <laughs> um, well, there you go. Now, um, question I have here for you, uh, obviously you didn't say who the uh, site was, you use example of, can you disclose who it was? Uh, is it now all been? Yeah, it was a hacker one. It was, this was also a hacker one, that's us. Yeah, okay, it was excellent. subdomain of hacker one. Okay, and, and I have one more question if you don't yeah. mind. What was the highest bounty you got? It was uh, $15,000. Oh, excellent. Okay, any more questions? For example, before or after taxes? <laughs> <laughs> after the taxes, it was uh, 30000 something. Can you go back to the OAuth one? Can you just explain how that works, right? Because uh, the bit I'm understanding is that. Uh, which one? The, oh, the one you got there, there, right? So you're basically saying that the, the exploit is once you put the two four slashes, you actually, the requests are sent to both. Example.com, yeah. Com. yeah, exactly. We need actually this precious code before. Actually, we are trying to steal that code, and this code will be given to the only the, the domain that actually redirected us to their site now. So you probably have seen that some, somewhere else, like in the Instagram, you said log in with the Facebook, and on the sites, log in with the Facebook. It's very easy. Single site. Yeah. So here, what we did actually. Whenever you try to change example.com with your attacker email, it will uh, drop your uh, request. It will say that actually this is a blacklisted domain, it's not whitelisted. So what we did actually, after the .com, we put two slashes and .com, which, uh, which is in our control, this domain. And the final response came like, the token was issued, which is here, and the final response was something like, example.com, two slashes, and .com, and it did not give any error. So it sends this code, which is a precious code, to bot, uh, bot domain. And that code is always the same? No, no, it's not always the same. No, no, it's, it's, it's it's the could token. be something, it's just a token. So it's the token. It, it yeah. must Basically, be if you log in with Instagram, let's say to a, another website, I don't know, some e-commerce website, right? That is the token that you get, right? So we say, if you, in that URL, if you, if you use this technique and you add your own site, uh, denniscruz.com, right, you will get that token. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, question for Chris. Hi, um, so if the callback URL is uh, is configurable only by a developer in a, in a locked dashboard, are you protected against this vulnerability? Against this one? There are really like, uh, OWASP has actually given us a lot of actually details about prevent this kind of attacks. 
everything is like every, whenever we actually the vendors uh, ask us for uh, mitigations, we take it from OWASP and send it down. Simple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. is a bad, but that's, yeah. So they meant he was just asking if you just have a whitelist of yes. domains, yes. would so, that be enough? Whitelist, whitelist domain. Well, no. So um, they don't know So um, I, I've built a system that that has an OAuth integration. Um, and a developer enters their callback URL into a locked dashboard. Um, so it's so uh, so the developer will log in with their own account, um, create an application, and they receive keys. Uh, part of that process is they also enter in what their callback URL will be. And that, that's set. That can't be changed from, from the front end. Um, does that protect against vulnerabilities like this? Yeah, it can be. Yes, well, it also depends how you validate it, right? If you validate using a regex, right? Yeah. Uh, then there is still a vulnerability in there. <laughs> so, so the callback URL was here. So, you, every time we have a different situations, you know, if, if there is a callback as if you're missing in this section. So, right, this was actually, you know, like, I have replacement. It, it was a Sony PlayStation sign. <laughs> And, and that's the swag from Sony. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you can, but like it, it is, when there is a callback function, you have to try with the callback function, have a, like, if, if there's a callback, callback function, you can try with the callback function as well. But you have to check, check the impact level. Because every time, it's not you come in with the callback function, it's like you redirect your right, it's only once. And sometimes it, it, it comes three, sometimes it comes two, but it depends which one is actually uh, redirecting back to your web page. You have to do it with that. Okay, we have time for one more question. So uh, normally all authentication requests go through HTTPS, right? Uh, this is, you know, you're an example of HTTP colon. So from a user's point of view, it, is this still trackable from a HTTPS side? It was HTTPS. I just changed, changed it to example.com. It was a PlayStation.com. And I already so disclosed that video on my YouTube channel, a live hacking video. So I will share the link on my Twitter uh, about my uh, YouTube channel. So you can watch all, of, all these live hacking videos from that. Yeah, I'll disclose it to that. We have one more question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, moving on from the award for a second, you disclosed uh, two cases whereby parameters were being validated only if the parameters were actually being set. It strikes me with my developer hat on that it's more code and more hassle to get this wrong than it is to get it right, which makes me think that it's probably some sort of silly library that's going for an enumerating all the parameters. Did you look for any such common library or common validation library that might be doing this? And do you, if you did, did you find anything and do you know what they were using? Because if it is a common library, there's probably a thousand little websites out there with the same problem. Yeah. Yeah, very good question. No, actually, I'm a bug hunter. I just try to find bounty as soon as I can. If you go back, where is it? I'll show you. Okay, as you can see in this code, which is Cisco code. I, when it came to this section, I knew that if the token is validated from the server side, I will leave it. And if you give, give, give me an error, I'll just leave it. I will go for something else. But when I remove this code, and it still says an invalid token, even the token was not present, then I simply remove this code line to test it what it comes and say it was happy, simply. So I always try to try to sharpen ways to run bounty, that's it. Okay. Excellent, thank you very much, Zuma. Yep, that's good. <laughs>
big, big thank you to Hoss for this evening, journalist partnership, Rehan Audrey. Thank you very much for organizing this. As you have seen, this is the canteen of John Lewis, and they were kind enough to bake all the pizzas for us. So uh, thank you very much for the pizzas. All the slides will be available on our website in a couple of days, and the videos, as soon as uh, Sharif uploads them to YouTube, will be there soon. Okay, uh, right, a few events coming up. We are preparing a hackathon and capture the flag competition. The dates will be announced as soon as we finalize all the challenges. So please do follow us to make sure you don't miss this. Right, another big announcement. Uh, those of you who participated in OWA Summit this year in June, there will be another OWA Summit next year in April 2018, organized by Dennis Cruz here. So it will be in the same venue, which is Centre Parks near Bedford. Uh, same format, a week of no presentations, just uh, people like us working together. Uh, so uh, yeah, make sure you register as soon as tickets uh, go up. Don't forget to uh, sign up to our mailing list, Twitter, Facebook, um, YouTube, Slack. Right, now, most important part of the evening, beer and networking, it's happening in this place, it's called Greenwood, this is a brand new bar opposite Victoria Station, it's about five minutes walk from here, looks like this, so you recognize it. Okay, so there's like a green wood sign here. We will be upstairs. It's a brand new big bar, so I'll see you there and we'll be buying three drinks. Thank you very much all for coming. Thank you for everyone watching the live stream. And we'll see you in two months time. Eating Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sam, Sam. <laughs> uh -huh.